Right, uh, health and safety announcement first. Uh, there is no fire alarm drill anticipated today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building through the nearest fire exit by following the green running man signs above the doors. Uh, please, make, please make your way to the rear of the car park muster point and wait for the organiser of the meeting to tell you uh, when it is safe to return. Toilets are available in the stairwell of the building at each floor landing. Water is available in reception. Finally, please make sure all phones are either muted or switched off. So, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this South and East Devon Habitat Regulations Ex Executive Committee meeting on the Thursday of the 3rd of November 2022. I'm your Chair, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Jeff Young. Can I remind everyone present that this meeting is being recorded for subsequent publication on the Council's website. Can you, all members, officers make a... Uh, start again. Can, can all members and officers making a contribution to the meeting please use the microphone or uh, your comments will not be recorded. So, agenda item one, public speaking. Have we got any public speakers? No, Chair, no public speakers, thanks. Uh, item number two, minutes of the previous meeting held on the uh, 17th of May 2022. Um, is, is it the committee's wish that I sign the minutes of the meeting as a true and accurate record? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Uh, agenda item three, apologies. I'm sorry, I've got a cough. <laughs> We're sorry you've got a cough. <laughs> um, uh, uh, do any members have uh, any interest to, to declare? I, I will, Chair, declare my usual interest. Thank you very much. Sorry, I do apologise. I can hear him so clearly I didn't. Um, I will declare my usual interest of uh, living in a house that overlooks the X and being treasurer of the local boat club. And I would do uh, my normal, but I'm a uh, parish councillor for uh, uh, Woodbury, which includes Exton, which is on the estuary, and my ward in includes part of the, um, uh, uh, the Pebble Bed Heaths. Thank you. Um, agenda item uh, five. Um, I don't believe there is any. So, agenda item six. Um, to agree the items to be dealt with after the public have left uh, excluded, which is NOM. So, agenda item seven, um, visitor, visitor access uh, improvements works update. And um, uh, if uh, Kim Strawbridge can do this presentation, please. Good morning. Uh, afternoon, everybody. So this is just a quick run through some updates on the visitor access improvements we've been making on the pebble beds. So just a bit of a reminder of where we are in this process. So back in 2019, we did our draft strategy. We then consulted on that later in that year and finalised the strategy in 2020. We then had to pause due to COVID. Um, but then we picked the project back up again when the Habitat team were, were back at work. We finalised the designs and the planning of the phase, the first phase of the works in 2021 and we delivered that phase in spring this year. We then finalised the design and the planning of phase two this summer and we're currently in the delivery phase of phase two at the moment. Um, I was just out on site this week and things are looking very good, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we, of course, have to finalise the final phase um, and deliver that as well. So this is a bit of the background for anyone that's maybe come to this project a little bit late. This is a section taken out of the original strategy that we had drawn up for us. So just a bit of a reminder of what its purpose was and some of the key principles that we've been working to. So the most important ones to note I've highlighted in orange because there's a lot of text there. Um, so really it's about... 
um, designing a car parking strategy that safe, safeguards the features of the Pebble Bed Heaths, SPA and SAC. Um, so it's sort of gathering visitors towards particular car parks, so preventing the sort of diffuse access that we had that had the potential to cause quite a lot of disturbance to features on the site. Retaining and developing car parks close to entry points to try and reduce the need for people to travel around the site, making them easy to access. Keeping the current number of car parking spaces the same, so no net gain in spaces because we don't really want the numbers to be going up. Establishing nodes of contact with people. So this is particularly thinking about our ability to engage with people and get across some of our other measures in the strategy. Making sure the design fit in with the location. So obviously we're in an A O M B. It's got a very special character about it. So making sure our designs were appropriate, but also making sure that vehicles were secure. So when we did our consultation, some of the reasons that people weren't using car parks and were parking at roadside was because they actually felt it was more secure to park there. And it's also thinking about how we can be flexible to change where people can park depending on the season and what's going on sensitive times of year. So where we're at, so phase one milestones, we started off bringing in WSP to support us with the project management. Um, we reviewed the phasing and the designs, particularly with respect to COVID-19, because that had a huge impact on how people were using the site. We went forward with four firs, Joanie's Cross, Stowford and Frying Pans, and they're the four sort of triangles you can see on the map of the site, so quite well spread. They were the ones that were thought to have the biggest impact, so the ones to sort of focus on first. We got planning granted at the end of last year, and we carried out works in spring this year. And so I've got some photos to kind of show where we're at. So the first photo with the large puddles shows the before and the second picture, which hopefully looks a lot smarter, is the after. Um, the things we were sort of looking at here were changing the layout to make it more efficient, but also it's difficult to see in this image, but we've got a track to the side now where all our operational vehicles and emergency services and things can access the heaths without going through the car park. So it will make it much safer um, and kind of keep the surfacing in much better condition. We've improved the drainage. Um, one of the things that put people off using this particular location was it would get quite eroded and the surface was a bit of an issue. Uh, we've tarmac the entrance where obviously we get the most wear and tear. Obviously we didn't want to tarmac the whole thing as much as it's about cost. It's also about in keeping with the local character of the, of the area. We've installed a height barrier. This is one of the areas where we have had issues with people either overnighting or travellers trying to set up fly tipping issues, those sorts of things. So it gives us a little bit more control. We've put in additional dog waste bins, um, which is always popular. We've got a lot of dog walkers, as we know. Um, off the back of the public consultation, one of the things we got and asked for was more cycle racks. So people wanted the ability to be able to cycle to site and then go for a walk, particularly if they lived in surrounding villages or in Exmouth. And currently there wasn't really any way you could securely leave a bike. So wherever we've been able to factor it in, the car parks want to have cycle racks. And we've also put in vehicle counters in all the sort of formal car parking areas so we can track usage over time, which will be really beneficial. This is a, just a quick picture of Joni's Cross. So this is the most northern car park that we have. So where the dog bins are in the, in the picture with the silver car, that is where the new entrance now is. So one of the issues with this one was the old entrance was right near a junction. It was also designed to be a chicane to deter trailed vehicles using it. But actually it was just not very nice, not very easy to access and hardly anyone used it. And instead they were parking all down the roadside. So actually changing the layout and the entrance to this location has made a huge difference already. We're seeing much less roadside parking and much more cars in the car park, which is what we want. So we have more control. Again, we've improved the surface, the drainage, tarmac to the entrances, again, put in a height barrier um, and cycle racks. The additional measure we did along here was also to put in passing place signage in all the passing places down the road. So for anyone that doesn't know this location, this is on a minor road through Hawkeland Common. And on that section of road, there's lots of laybys where you could, in theory, pull in and park. They're meant to be passing places for vehicles, but people would park in them and then go off for a walk. So we really had little control over the access in that location, and it's now much, much better. 
So phase two, this is what we're working on currently. So again, we contracted WSP to support us with our project management. Uh, we reviewed the phasing and the designs. The ones we decided to go forward with on this one were the Warren, Woodbury Castle and Estuary View. So these are the three red triangles on the map. Um, I'm sure plenty of people have heard of Woodbury Castle. That's probably one of the most well-loved parts of the heaths. Um, and so we've put quite a lot of thought in how we get this sort of package of, of car parks right. Planning was granted this year and the works have started this autumn. Oh, yeah, we got a dodgy connection. Let's go off and on. Because it's temporary. There we go. A bit temperamental. That's very strange. I didn't even touch it. So I reload it because it's not picking up stuff. So. <coughs> yeah, it did, didn't it? There we go. Let's try yeah. again. Yeah. All right, bear with me. We're back to where I was. Okay, thanks. So where we are with phase two is uh, the one we're currently working on at the moment. So we've started walk up work on the Warren car park. This is just a, an image of the, the new entrance. So again, we've separated off operational vehicles which will access the heath and those vehicles that will go into the car park. Um, we've tweaked the layout slightly just to make it a little bit more efficient, but we don't need to redo the surfacing in this one as it, it, it didn't need as much attention as some of the other larger ones. We have improved some of the access through the paths to try and deter people from sort of walking through the vehicle access. And again, as with the other ones, we'll be installing a height barrier, we're putting in cycle racks, additional dog bins, and again, a vehicle counter. Um, so it's all sort of coming along. We're hoping to finish this one tomorrow. It was, should have been finished earlier this week, but the weather we've had this week has not been on our side. Um, so we couldn't get back out with the tarmac, but it should hopefully be reopened on um, Friday. And then the other two car parks in this phase are obviously Estuary View and Woodbury Castle. And again, it's the same sort of suite of measures. Estuary view is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more involved. So for those of you that, that don't know it, Estuary view car park is along a track and at the, the sort of end of a track, there's a viewpoint overlooking the access estuary towards Dartmoor. Because it's a distance from the road, it's, it's always been quite a tricky one to manage. Um, and we've been getting increasing levels of antisocial behavior down there, all the kind of usual things I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so as part of the strategy, we decided that long term that hard standing would be closed off to vehicles we'd improve the parking at the roadside because that's much more secure we can keep an eye on it much more easily um, and we would put in an, an easy access path from the new parking to the viewpoint and again that was off the back of the public consultation we got quite a lot of feedback from people saying that they liked driving to the viewpoint because they were maybe a bit less able and they would sit in their car and enjoy the view and the countryside so we've looked at how we can make it as accessible as possible, but reduce the need for vehicles to actually get to the viewpoint itself. Um, and those measures have gone down well. We've actually had to temporarily close Estuary View Park car park this summer because the antisocial behaviour got to such an unacceptable level. Um, and so I have been getting quite regular inquiries from people asking what the long term answer is. But as soon as you sort of explain our approach, um, people get it, which is great. And those car parks should uh, be starting work later this month. We're just waiting on scheduled monument consent. And another big part of this project, which has sort of gone in tandem with the works on the ground, is developing a new suite of signage and interpretation for the site. So these are just some photos of some examples of signs that have already gone in. Um, a lot of thought has gone into these signs. It's taken quite a while to get them sort of just right. We were really keen that they're obviously eye-catching um, and draw people to them, but we didn't want them to sort of stand out too much in the landscape. So it's always a bit of a balance. Um, and we've got sort of three different designs. So the sort of the two bigger images, they're what we call our primary signs. They go in all the main car parks. They very clearly state where people are, the fact that it's a nature reserve. Um, and have a map so people can orientate themselves. But they also very clearly state expected behaviour, so what people should and shouldn't be doing. 
we also have a little bit of interpretation on there so sort of talking about the special features of the site um why it's such a lovely place what people can see where they can go for a walk we also have um clip frames so we can put in temporary signage and that's a really important sort of crossover with the other mitigation measures so you may not be able to see it on the screen but that center image you can see two clip frames sort of bottom right of the sign one currently has a poster in for our waggy walks that we do with Devon Loves Dogs, and the other one has a poster of our bike code. So both of those things were developed by this project. Um, so it really kind of goes to show the importance of having all the different measures and how they link together. And then we've also got threshold signs, the sort of name entrance signs on all the formal car parking areas. And then the small image bottom right is our kind of smaller signs for our more informal roadside parking areas. Um, which is a massive gain for us because before that we didn't really have any way of communicating with the public and getting them to understand that it was a nature reserve and, and how they were expected to behave. So things left to do. So of course we've got to finish phase two, which is where we are currently. Uh, finalize, finalize phase three and get that through planning and delivered. And phase three is sort of the southern end of the site. So we've got model airfield, Uphams, Wheat Hill and Squadmore, for anyone that knows those locations. And we've also got to install the signage that goes with those as well. So all the signage has been designed, but obviously it can't be installed to the, the car park works are finished. And then there'll be a sort of process of review and debrief um, to make sure that we're happy with everything. I just thought I'd put in a couple of images to show some of the changes that we're sort of seeing already. Um, so another thing we've designed in at Four Furs and Joni's are sort of what we're calling safe spaces or engagement spaces. And these are really important for Devon Loves Dogs and the mitigation wardens as sort of safe areas where they can do their pop-ups and start walks and engage with the public. Um, that picture of the cabin was during Heath Week um, and we'd literally just set up, which is why it was very quiet at that point, um, but it has been really, really valuable um, as a sort of hub to talk to people from. Um, bike whack racks are well used, which is great. Um, and also the passing places are nice and empty with no cars in them, which is what we want. <laughs> and that's it for me, unless anyone's got any questions. Any questions, folks? Yes, Councillor. I'd, say, I'd like to say congratulations. That's a fantastic presentation. You told us exactly what you're trying to do while you're doing it, what you've done, how it's working, and even given us an indication of how you're measuring it successful. I think that is brilliant. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, yeah, um, fantastic presentation um, and fantastic work. Um, I've been using the cycle racks. Um, um, <laughs> Brilliant. Th they're in a good location because they're <coughs> not hidden away, um, fairly close to the uh, entrance. Um, have you had any problems with height restrictions? Was it going to be a question? Uh, landscaping ob obviously will come. Um, uh, things will grow. Um, I was up there in August and just everything was brown. Um, uh, you haven't mentioned much of more, no. um, what's going to happen there. Um, and one or two people have said it'd be nice to have signage on the common to where the, the, the car parks are because they walk away mm -hmm. and they can't find the, okay. the car park back again. <laughs> <laughs> right, I will try to remember the, all those questions. I'll start off with Mutters because that's an easy one. Um, so we will be doing some work at Mutters, but that's obviously not part of this specific project because it's not in the SAC SPA. So it's still land that we, our team, manage and it's still within the NNR, but obviously it's not funded through this funding stream. So we have designed our signage, for example, alongside this project. So it looks seamless. It looks the same because it's in the NNR, but the Conservation Trust will be paying for it ourselves and the rest of the work at Matters ourselves. Um, the other question was signage. So one of the decisions that was taken was not to put lots of signage on site. So again, as part of the consultation and as our team, we think it's really important that the sort of the open, uncluttered nature of the site is left kind of as true as it can be. So we've made a conscious decision to mainly have signage in the car parks and the access points to the heaths. That said, there are way markers and we're looking at more way marked trails across the site. But in terms of people navigating their way around, it will be a case of them having to 
use a map, learn the site, learn how to use viewpoints. We can't sort of put lots more signage other than what's there for public rights of way already. And there was one other question I thought. <laughs> was there a third one? Uh, oh, height restrictions, that was it. Um, so height restrictions are a really interesting one. Um, and actually, I expected to get a lot more emails of people concerned about them. Actually, I haven't had any at all. Um, I've had some conversations with some horse riders who horse box their horses up to ride. Um, they are quite low in number. Most people hack to sight and then ride. What we've decided to do was that um, basically Wheat Hill Car Park will be the car park that we will encourage horse riders with horse boxes to use. It's much bigger and we won't be sort of closing a height barrier across that one and it's much easier for them to manoeuvre in. We're now at a point where most of the car parks are so busy most of the time I wouldn't want a horse box in there because it would not be safe to load and unload horses in there. Um, but other than that, we've not had many inquiries at all. So hopefully people are happy with them. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Ripley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned the vehicle counters and you mm -hmm. mentioned your car parks are very busy. I presume we'll see those as part of the yes. data reported back on a periodic yes. basis through to you this will. committee. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. So we can see the trends and how it's growing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. We also, alongside this, so we'll have the vehicle counters in all the main car parks, but we do also have a couple of locations where we have footpath counters as well, um, recently funded by the AOMB. So although it's, it's not a sort of a measure that's been paid for by this, we will still have that data as well. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, just to go back to the, the height barriers, um, it's good to know that you haven't had much pushback on that. Um, in terms of the kind of the, the height barrier, obviously, is only over the entrance. Mm -hmm. um, are you managing the rest of the access through kind of vegetation or ditches or bonds? or Because, yes. you know, we all know that, that the determined... Um, <laughs> particular sections of society, you know, kind of aren't necessarily uh, deterred by the, the height barriers. And I'm not talking about people with camper vans who want yeah. somewhere to stay overnight. No, that's it. And that's one of the things we've also been doing. So where we've got, for example, the passing places where we're discouraging parking, we've gone through and we've kind of reinforced the bunding around those to keep them as, sort of as small as we can. Um, and yeah, putting in bunding, ditching posts and things elsewhere. Um, I mean, our main approach is making the car parks as, as attractive as possible to get people in, but people that don't want to be in them, we also need to put things in place to stop them where we don't want them to be. So we're doing it kind of in tandem. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'd like to make a change to the um, presentation today and move uh, to, uh, item nine now. Um, if we may, um, because I believe the um, presenter needs to get off on the train. We'll just, we'll just swap some IT around there. <coughs> Give right. us a moment. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so <laughs> can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, so uh, I think everybody knows me, but just in case, um, I'm Estelle Skinner um, and I'm the Green Infrastructure Officer for Teambridge District Council. Um, myself and um, Sean Avon, who's our Senior Ranger. Um, oh, okay, let me bring it a bit closer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So myself and and Charlie and our senior ranger have just been asked to come and uh, give a bit of a sort of refresh on uh, the Ridgetop Park sayings at Matford, um, and just to give a bit of an update as well about what's what's happening out there. Um, so um, yeah, just in, with the introductory slide here. Um, just kind of re-emphasising really the, the partnership approach here that's that's been really integral. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of different people involved, um, including Land Trust. We've got Hannah Bosens uh, here with us today, who is part of Land Trust's um, estates team. So um, she's a really key contact now for the operation of the site, working with Sean and, and myself as, as well. Uh, so, what this photo is showing is the kind of the early, very early part of the process, really. So, looking back at um, the the time of, of reviewing the site and looking at the allocations as part of the local plan. Um, so, my my manager there, Fergus Pate, and also somebody from our um, uh, economy and estates team there, kind of um, giving giving the site a good. Um, look over and uh, I mean you can see even back then the the real draw of those um, those great viewpoints um, which are uh, yeah real really focal part of of the site um, so yeah so just to say a bit a bit more about about the site we've obviously in terms of uh, the selection of the site, looking at the Natural England criteria and looking at what the site was going to offer and we're very much looking at obviously that rural feel. Um, you can see from this um, OS map that um, you might look at it and think you're not necessarily going to get that rural feel but actually despite having the busy road network kind of around the exterior, um, somewhat removed from it, um, not immediately along the exterior of the site, but I think the height of the site and those views really kind of give you that distance and actually you do feel quite um, quite rural when, you know, in a rural setting when you are actually out there, which is, is really great. Um, Yeah, so again, just to say that um, we're looking, so just to set the scene, um, we're just north of north of Exminster and south of Marsh Barton and, and Alfington, just up to the, the northwest there. Um, there are also active links um, connected in with the, the area. So there's the Access Street Trail um, just off to, to the east there. Um, there's links going into uh, towards Exeter Quay. Um, and uh, obviously with the, the accessory trail, you can also continue down to as far as Dawlish. Um, the new Marsh Bottom Rail, um, rail station is coming forward um, obviously soon and uh, there would be a relatively short um, cycle or walk from there to, to the Ridgetop Park as well. Um, we have had a lot of people accessing via the um, the quiet lane, um, up Deepway Lane, um, to get to the site, although it is undulating, you've got to climb up to get up there. Um, I think a lot of people are doing that, aren't they, from, um, from what we've seen. Um, so that's been really good. Uh, so this slide is just giving you a, a kind of general layout in terms of the, uh, the Sangs allocation area and also the associated development areas. Um, so the, the development areas there encompass uh, policy SWE1. Um, so we've got uh, predominantly Vistry there with also the new school coming forward. Um, the new uh, link, uh, link bridge will be coming as well to link the, 
the north and the south sides of the A379. Um, so those those two sort of fishery areas that lie either side of that that busy road um, will be facilitated with a pedestrian and cycle bridge um, that will be coming forward next year. Um, there's also um, at a lesser scale there's the Barrett's development, um, Mr. Parr's land, um, and also Cavana, who are. Um, uh, all currently being built out apart from the, the PAR, par site. Um, uh, so here we can, we can see the, the SANGS phasing plan, um, so areas um, A1, B and K um, have already opened to the public um, and this encompasses around 20 hectares tears of, of land. Um, there will be further phases coming forward, so um, parcel D there, which is in association with, with um, the PAR development, um, and also further land for to facilitate fish trees development. So um, the Trude Lane in a landfill site, which is shown as parcel A3 there, um, that is um, currently going through a process of um, renewing the restoration um, to, uh, to reflect the outputs of the site being a sangs rather than going back to, to previous agricultural land. Um, so ultimately, the site will cover approximately 38 hectares. There is also additional capacity still within the allocation that hasn't been used. Um, so this is showing an overview of the first car park that will be coming forward. Um, this is uh, currently being built out by Vistry. It, uh, it contains 17 spaces, um, cycle parking. Um, it is on the edge of the western, the southwestern extent of the, the Sangs lands. So coming into that parcel A1 that we were looking at there. Um, and people would come through the public open space that's shown there along the pathway and then over a footbridge into the Sangs where um, Sean's created a nice natural orchard, um, heritage orchard area. Um, so we anticipate this would be coming forward pretty imminently, um, certainly by the end of this um, calendar year. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll hold a hand over to Sean, and um, who's got some <laughs> lovely photos to show you. Did you want to swap so you can click through, Sean? Actually, yes, yeah. that might. I'll turn that back. Sure. Okay. So it's just... It's just the enter button and it's already on the Lovely. Oh, there, okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us along. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to do a bit of a whistle stop tour, revisiting, establishing the first half of this exciting site. As Estelle said, lots of different people are involved, um, uh, strategically uh, obtaining the land and coming up with a strategy. So the Rangers were let loose with their land trust strategy under their arm that Estelle's had a input into um, uh, but before we got digging or installing anything it was important that we really uh, sussed out and didn't do any harm so we were aware we had pylons over one field and lots and lots of services crisscrossing underground so we were quick to make friends with the gas men these are the high pressure gas men there was also a medium pressure gas man an electricity person and a water person so they were very helpful to us to make sure that we were very clear where things were and and didn't uh, blow anything up or cause any problems. Um, we were also anxious before we worked out where paths and dog bins and benches would precisely go that we didn't inadvertently dig up any precious archaeology and we were aware from um, being kindly involved and given tours by the local archaeologists that the area is rich in Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman, all sorts of different eras represented. Um, and so these, these chaps are, are archaeologists and the thing that looks a bit like a Blue Peter project with jiffy bags is actually thousands of pounds worth of magnetometry equipment um, and that time team style they they checked all the areas as well and this was important not only in terms of digging holes but in terms of where we planted trees so we couldn't plant trees on top of a gas main neither on top of precious archaeology so we ended up with this kind of battleships map of where we should and shouldn't do things. 
Um, having established that, the, the next task was to get the boundaries sorted out, and this involved removing decades of old stock netting and barbed wire, as you can imagine, from working farmland, um, but also to get firm boundaries in place that were dog-proof. And obviously the purpose of the SANG is to attract people away from sensitive areas where um, dogs need to be on lead, leads, so the ex-estuary where we've got arctic waders you wouldn't want to disturb, and the pebble beds with their ground nesting birds. So this is a place where we say, come and let your dog off the lead. But we've got those major roads, the M5, the A30 and so on. So after um, some thought, we've got um, equestrian netting that is sort of Jack Russell proof, and it's up to 1.2 metres. So I was measuring my greyhound against it and seeing what leaping capacity there was. Um, so we've, we've, we've hopefully optimised the, the height and dimensions of that. It's on chestnut posts, uh, so there's no chemicals needed and um, it'll be long-lasting. Um, we also opted for uh, chemical-free gates. So we've got natural oak gates, which were produced by a local sawmill, and we felt it was important to really celebrate the rural character. It's a real strength of the area and, um, and give, give these nice entranceways. Um, a cell throughout this is, is uh, been liaising with all the various different parties that are necessary in a project like this. And um, this is her talking to uh, Russell from BT Jenkins, who look after the soil landfill, sort of at the centre of the, the site, and which will ultimately form part of the park, and building trust and goodwill with them as we're working together and support. And that meant that when we discovered, when one of my fellow rangers discovered from the... Devon Records Office, where we went just to see if there was any quirky field names or anything like that that we could, you know, capture, um, that there was this nice feature called Cuckoo Hill. But Cuckoo Hill wasn't there because it was in the landfill area, but they've put it back, and that's due to the efforts of uh, Estelle and Beatty Jenkins and I think the County Council and various people, um, that as, as a, a sort of tweaking of, of all the gradients, it was possible to have a hill back. So that's been a fun thing, and it's greening up. The, the final bits are now greening up. Um, there's, uh, there's bits of wetland as well. There's quite a bit of diversity within this ground. We did think we had a stream. There was a stream on the thing under our arm, but when we clambered around, we found that actually uh, the marsh uh, was a marsh, but there was no stream. It had been piped decades previous to that, um, and it was a leaky pipe, so we had a marsh. But anyway, the, we, uh, we spoke very nicely to our drainage engineers and said, do you think we could possibly, possibly... And he said, deculvert it, and that was a new word to me, but we said, yes, please. So they, they sought the necessary permissions and um, did some profiles in order that we could release this stream from its pipe. Um, and as we were wandering through the marsh, we, we came across... Um, little round nests about the same size as a, a tennis ball in the base of the vegetation. And as, as you may be familiar, these, these were nests of harvest mice. Um, so we didn't want to harm those. Those were a nice feature. So we left some of the marsh untouched. And um, the lady in the orange high-vis before um, was a, a friend from the Mammal Society, and she agreed to come out, trained us and our volunteers in the art of... Uh, finding harvest mice, most terrifyingly, how to check if they're still occupied, by squeezing them, just so, very gently, to see whether they're a disused one or, or one that still has occupants. Um, so we, we went all the way through the marsh and pegged out and avoided any, uh, any harvest mice nests. We also moved anybody else who would have been at, at risk from uh, the machinery to come into other areas. Uh, so plenty of toads were, were carefully carried. Um, and then we, after looking at various contractors, realised that our, our neighbours, BT Jenkins, the landfill operators, had the skill set uh, and experience to be the ones to release the stream. Um, the engineers came up with a um, profile, optimum profile for the stream, and this was fed into the machine. The guy under the arm of the digger has got a stake with a blob on the top, and that's a GPS gadget. I'm sure it's got a better name than that. And that's talking to the blobs on the digger which are also GPS gadgets, and um, that meant that the precise profile could be recreated uh, on the ground. There's a skilled driver in the mix as well, um, but they were able to recreate that stream. So it's nice to have Church Brook Stream, I think it's called, back, as well as the hill. Um, and we, it was rapidly christened by herons flying up and down and pooing all over the new mud and uh, 
kingfishers and even wood sandpiper and so on. So it's an extra habitat uh, reinforced um, that's going on. Um, there are three woodlands associated with the park, three mature woodlands. Church Path Hill Plantation, which I can now say without hesitation, The Haven and Kiln Close. Um, some of them have got non-native species in, um, cherry, cherry laurel, <coughs> excuse me, and snowberry, much favoured by the Victorians, but not so good for the native wildlife. And so we've been working to clear these and let the native flora uh, come back. Uh, we've also reinforced the hedgerows. This particular hedgerow along Barleyfield had just become a line of oaks. They're very beautiful oak trees, but we've now underplanted that with native whips and reinforced any other gappy hedgerows. Um, they've got biodegradable bio um, tree guards on them, and we've put mulch, which was donated just for the haulage cost, by a tree contractor who liked the idea of the project. Um, so that helped to get them through the drought, and despite the droughts, uh, with one lot of watering, we had very little losses. Um, predominant habitat across Ridgetop is, is grassland, which has been grazed pasture, um, but we wanted to make this more biodiverse because it's about attracting people in, but if it's an attractive, interesting place, I think that's more of a draw for people as well as... Um, responding to the ecological emergency we're, we're in as well. Um, so with Estelle's guidance and her ecological hat on, we did some soil tests and soil pits. And we, um, as well as changing the mowing regime to sort of favour hay meadow, we um, chose some hot spots and some enrichment patches, if you like. And on those, we stripped off the turf and the topsoil. And that reduced the nutrients in those areas which gave the wildflowers the competitive advantage over the grasses. So those have been a success, I think there's five of them and they've been very colourful, absolutely buzzing with bees, butterflies, dragonflies catching the other things and so on. And the idea is we can use those as a sort of skin graft to enrich, to produce species rich hay and seed for other areas uh, and go on with that. Um, as Estelle's alluded to, the most striking thing about Ridgetop really are its incredible views and those that identified the land and negotiated, I think, um, are to be congratulated on that. It gives you that sense of uh, fresh air and space, which I think helps it compete with a visit to the coast or the space of the heaths. And we're trying to get people away from there. You really do feel you've been somewhere and you've had some fresh air. This is looking west, that's the A30. Um, we realised as we were going along that the viewpoints, two of the key viewpoints were due east and due west, and we realised that we could make a bit of a feature of that. So this seat is the sunset seat and aligns with the sunset. I'll explain a little more in the next couple of slides. Um, this view is to the east and is quite different, but is also very beautiful. And we have this natural sort of downland coombe where the shadows play and early in the morning and the mist sits in the hollows, it's, it's just gorgeous. Um, coming back a little bit on the eastward viewpoint, we've made a mirroring sunrise seat and um, we've had a bit of fun once we'd finished the terrifying fencing and other parts and not blown anything up. We had, a, had some fun with the benches and this is designed, the sunrise seat, so that twice a year on the equinox, on the spring equinox and the autumn equinox, the sun rises directly in the centre of the bench and then it gradually moves along. It's moving to the right at the moment. So by the winter solstice on December 21st, the sun will rise aligned with the right-hand end of the bench and then it'll make its way, dum-dum-dum-dum-dum, all the way back across until by midsummer it sun rises by the left-hand end of the bench. The same is obviously true in mirror with the sunset bench, so uh, we enjoy doing that. Um, uh, we've also tried to weave in Exeter's woolen history, um, and these are two life-size sheep, um, Kersey, a Devon long wool, and Serge, a Devon close wool. Um, and these are named after the types of cloth that were woven from those fleeces in the Exeter area and made Exeter very wealthy in its past. We also look to celebrate the wildlife of the area with the carvings, and this is a tawny owl which now stands guard over the sunset seat in another part of the park. 
Um, and we had a third viewpoint, neither east nor west, but had big skyscapes, scapes, as one of my colleagues observed. And so we decided to call it Cloud Base, and we put in a sky watching seat, which is what this is. And it was kind of inspired by a bench we've seen somewhere in East Devon, which I think is a giant sundial. Um, this isn't a sundial, this one's looking at clouds or constellations, depending on when you go there. Um, but we just felt that took in the roof of the park and just gives an, literally another dimension. Um, this was during construction, but it's now got interpretive disks on all those logs, different uh, types of cloud, different star constellations that, that you can look at. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of where we've got to, and I think that's uh, the, the next phase awaits. So we shall have our spinach and take a deep breath and move on with that. But it's been fun. Uh, Thank you, Estelle and uh, Sharm, on that wonderful um, presentation. Um, I do like the, um, the, the fencing and the, uh, the, the gates and the, the natural appearance of them. And you actually moved a hill, which is <laughs> pretty good going. Um, so have we got any questions? Uh, Not a question so much as um, just to, to echo the thanks. I mean, it's a great presentation. Um, and quite clearly, a heck of a lot has happened since we, we were just agreeing. It's about 12 months since we, we met you up there and, and, and had a tour. And I, I don't know about my colleagues, but I think it's high time we went, we went back and had another look at it. Um, and, and like Councillor Young, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed that you um, just replaced the hill and rediscovered a stream. And you make it sound, you know, kind of like, yeah, we just got these guys in. And, <laughs> and I think that clearly there's been a, an awful lot of work and an awful lot of partnership collaboration on this so I think everybody involves to be congratulated and it's so it's so close to the city I think that's the magic of it I mean until I went up there you know I drive up and down that road as I'm sure we all do um, and it literally is right on our doorstep so uh, no it's it's great and say seriously I would love to uh, to go back and, um, and and take another look at it thank you Oh, yeah, we'll have to set something up, yeah. Councillor Ripley. And, and uh, I, I, they've stolen everything I wanted to say. I mean, it's <laughs> exactly that. I mean, I love what you've done with the place. It's absolutely great. And, and moving hills and making streams, I mean, you must be demigods, you know. I mean, that, that, that's all I can conclude. <laughs> so, so, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and I did have... Oh, Exactly where the car, where, where is the car park? Uh, I couldn't quite work out where the car park was on, on, the, on the map. Um, yeah, so that car park that I showed, which Fish Street is delivering, it's at the end of Trude Lane. Um, so it's... Um, yeah, so can you it's, show it's, us the map? Oh, you think you've got oh yeah. yeah. yeah so it's at, at, at the, at the bottom of the hill. click back a little bit. It, if you were coming down on. towards the roundabout with the Devon Hotel on it. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's the turning before the hotel, but you have to actually go round the roundabout and come back, and then it's first left. Uh, oh, is it that? Yeah. Let's see. Um, Wait, up towards where it says Trude House, perhaps. Oh, is it where the W is? It's not showing. It's not showing. It's not helping, am I? So yeah, I could go so and point it's... on something. <laughs> so Which one can I reach? <laughs> Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't think we can re really do pointing stick, but it's, if you're at the Devon Hotel roundabout and you carry on, it would be the next turning kind of on your left, and it's a dead end road, so you can't continue through. At the end, you reach where the A30 is. This, this yellow road. <laughs> yeah. Mm. This is my level of. <laughs> so, so, so it's so coming back. about where the W is, is it? Um, the, the road, you don't, where don't, it says Trude House, yeah. you come further down there to the dead. end. Basically, yeah. it's a dead end. At the mo it was a hammerhead dead end parking well, space. Park. And there's now a car park oh, onto right. that. At the end of that. Yeah. yeah, and then you come in, you'll come in over that blue stream, which is the, the stream that's it come back. Yeah. This um, Sorry, I'm, am I right in thinking that Matford Lane is going to be declassified? I don't know if we have a final answer on it, but I think it was being perhaps considered about whether it would be access only or no through road or something yeah, like that. Yeah, so we think it will be, it will be bigger right. because I understand the no through road, but I think Devon County Council need to do some consultation on it. 
Um, but yeah, actually you can see it on the plan. Oh, the little plan red dot. There, just at the end, can you see just a Ah, got there. it. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. So it's it's, it's quite a walk to it, get up. It's interesting. It's we've become acclimatised through through. Sorry, we've become acclimatised to where we've gone in. Um, to establish the park, but I was just talking to Alison about how there is an awful lot at the western edge of the park. Um, there's an orchard, there's the stream, there's a viewing screen of a pond, uh, there's Haven Wood, which is full of wildlife, deer and foxes and badgers and all sorts of things, and we've got some old uh, agricultural machinery that we've interpreted, and some of the wildflower hotspots. So you are needing to walk up from there, but there's an awful lot at that side of the park which we're going to start sort of celebrating. We've got a Go West walk coming up that's going to particularly look at that part of the park. So where it says parcel six, that's uh, housing, is it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's the Fish Street development. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for presentation. Uh, so uh, we now go back to item item eight. And who have we got for item eight? Uh, I have to speak to this item, Chair. Thank you. So, as set out in the agenda, um, we have set out the further clarification required on the drones, personal aircraft, code of conduct, and the justification um, for the expenditure on the Pebble Beds car park. And through the Chair, I suggest that we deal with these items in turn. Thank you, Chair. Um, so with the personal aircraft, it's been suggested to prepare a single code of conduct for all personal aircraft, with the two options um, set out for consultation, which is option one, a focused consultation, or option two, a wider consultation. And from discussion with our officer working group, um, it was suggested that we um, work with option one. But happy to take any questions on that item. Have we any questions? Yes, Councillor Ridley. Um, specific stakeholders, I presume you're talking sort of flying clubs. I'm, I'm still slightly bemused on the personal aircraft thing, because I was got confused. If you remember last time, I was questioning whether it, drones and personal aircraft were the same sorts of people. So I guess. Are you looking at, I say flying clubs, again, it doesn't really help clarify, does it? Are you looking at, what, who, what, are, the, what are the specific stakeholders that you're talking about in that focus group, please? Um, so with, the, with those, we'd be um, working, um, working to identify um, who those stakeholders will be. So that will be the various clubs which, which operate in the, in the area. Um, we'd be in discussion with Extra Airport to understand who is, is utilising space, but also um, drone operatives and, and those types of, of clubs. We haven't fully um, sketched out who those stakeholders are at this stage, but we'd be working to identify those groups working um, working with organisations who would be able to identify those. And it's likely through this type of consultation process that further users will identify themselves as, as we start that process. Uh, Councillor Sutton. Thank you, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, this is this is a useful um, update. Thank you for, for this. Um, I, I'm inclined to agree that your option one is the most sensible, not just because it's cheapest and, and times are hard and, and money you know, needs to go as far as it can. Um, but it just seems to me that there's a whole section of the wider public, and I would put myself in that, um, who has no interest in, in drones or model aircraft or, or anything else. So, you know, frankly, including 
the likes of me in that consultation will, will tell you absolutely nothing other than um, I'm not interested. <laughs> and I, I do get that this is comparatively new kind of hobby and, and technology. So um, it sounds to me as if you're making the right contacts. But I think the other advantage of producing a code of conduct code of conduct um, that is informed by the people who are interested and do own these things means that they can become a bit like the the um, the devon loves dogs they can become the ambassadors for the best practice and and as and when they might find people who aren't um following a code of conduct might if you like police it for us and probably more effectively than um, a, a random mem member of the public who like me who doesn't know what they're talking about <laughs> so thank you for this uh i think thank you for that um this is a code of conduct just for these areas isn't it and um i believe that east devon are looking at a a, a drone uh, policy for the whole of the district which is, is sep separate too and um, maybe now the other councils can um, look at that. Um, we also have been looking at, um, um, at lanterns. It's another issue that um, we, we're looking at at the moment. Um, I, I think Teambridge has done something about lanterns, but that at the moment applies only to Teambridge land, mm -hmm. but then that might be relevant. Um, could you just remind me on drones? At the moment, am I right in thinking that they need to fly a drone? You need a, uh, in, in, in a public space, you need some sort of license these days. I, unfortunately, I'm unable to answer that, that question. I'm not, I'm not aware of the legislation um, regarding drones. Oh, okay, I can help you on that. But there is, um, uh, there's some, uh, Regulations coming through from government on uh, licenses for for drones uh, depends on what um, what power they are. Uh, so I'm told, and also uh, the restrictions on where you can fly them, uh, over what property and uh, what height and stuff like that. But it's been delayed, as you can expect. I wonder why. <laughs> Is there any other questions? No, no thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we've sort of clarified some of the ambiguities that we had in the in the previous meeting, and uh, it's unfortunate it takes so long with the cycle to do that. Um, but uh, let's get on with it. Yep. Thank you very much. So, so Chair, are you in agreement then that you're all up for option one as opposed to option two? Just so that I can clarify that for the minutes. That's great. Thank you very much. Right. Um, thank, you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Can we go on to the second part, the yep. um, Pebble Bed Heath? Sorry, Chair. Uh, the Pebble Bed Heath visitor access improvements, and with regards to the justification, um, we've set out some um, some bullet points within within the report. Um, um, that you, you should have access to and we received a detailed presentation from Kim Strawbridge today and so I hope that provides us with the information um, required to approve this item. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much. Yes, the presentation uh, um, at the beginning of the meeting was uh, exceptionally helpful in making it very clear and it, it's all fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. So uh, we, we accept this. Accept that. Yep. Thank you very much. And is that that? that that's all, is it, yes. Naomi? Yes, thank you, Chair. Oh, right. Thank you very much. So, Chair, can I just ask, are, are we looking at the, so we've got three resolutions here, or the, so we're just clarifying on resolution one. I'm just concerned still about the Dawlish Warren changes that are going through. I'm not sure where the right point in this meeting is to bring that up. Item number three on this one, further report relating to proposed changes to the migration strategy, sorry, wrong glasses, mitigation strategy regarding Dawlish Warren excess tree and the Dawlish Warren beach management scheme. We had a massive um, amount of concern when we had the excess tree uh, forum in Exmouth where we had the Environment Agency talking about how the Warren is basically down to, as far as I can understand, natural England 
instruction being removed, the, the, the geotube is being removed early. So the current proposal is that the warren will be allowed to go. It will break through in the middle, which will break through by the, uh, the, 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 the lake in the middle there, the Green, Greenhorn Lake. And the warren will change dramatically. That will have massive impact on the refuge zone behind it. And I'm not seeing this on our agenda, nor am I seeing it actually being addressed and discussed through this committee. I understand this committee has a um, remit for man-made incursion, an incursion due to increased population. However, this is going to be a massive change on what we're trying to do in the ex-estuary. So I'm concerned that we've not seen anything further on that. I saw it in this, in this item here, so I thought it apt to bring it up. So it would be extraordinarily helpful to have that sooner rather than later whilst the consultation is going on about what the Environment Agency are intending to do with the Warren and whether they preserve it or not, and whether Natural England is content that one arm is saying, remove the geotube and allow that to go, and the other arm is saying, preserve the feeding areas behind the beach, which will be destroyed as soon as the wave-breaking function of the Warren is removed. So we have a fundamental dichotomy of how we go forward in terms of protecting the Warren. And it's something I think this committee needs to be aware of and address and to understand the two different positions, as I see it, from within Natural England, who are the drivers behind having that geotube removed, which is being removed down to A, the sand being removed and it being exposed, and B, the increased people population such that it was damaged through vandalism. So I don't know where we go with that one. Sorry about that. Uh, th thanks, you, Councillor uh, Gleek. Um, Ali from the uh, yeah, Natural England. I'm not able to access the papers. The mention of the, the mention of this was this proposed to have a paper on it for the next. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I haven't got access to the papers. I can't um, get through to them. But the mention of the of this issue is this proposed for a report for the next committee. Is that why it was mentioned? Um, and, until we until we. Mm. Oh, <laughs> um, it, it was in the previous meeting on the 17th of May, we agreed that we would receive a further report relating to proposed changes to the mitigation strategy regarding Dawlish Warren and the excess tree in relation to the Dawlish Warren Beach Management Scheme. So that was in May that we asked for that, that report. Uh, we are now here in October. Our next meeting is, is, I'm not sure when. We don't have a forward plan for what comes up at these meetings. So I'm asking, I think, where that report is and when it is, given that the Environment Agency are currently in the middle of doing their consultation, their review is all finished, they're doing their consultation, and unless we are quick, this will be decided outside of this committee by the Environment Agency, who will complete their consultation without us having any say-so or input into it. As, as far as I am aware, that, um the um, um, Environment Agency are now looking at what the impact will be on the rest of the estuary, uh, which is our concern. Um, and I, I don't think that report is, is uh, ready when I was speaking uh, um, to Natural England. Um, I don't know if Naomi can um, come, come in on that. Thank you, Chair. So at time of writing, um, these reports, the um, the review by the Environment Interagency has not been completed. That's why we haven't brought it back as an item. And we are in continued dialogue with the Environment Agency to understand when that's um, completed and then they'll be happy to um, we'll be happy to prepare a report for this and the the impact um, that scheme has on the mitigation strategy for Dawlish Warren and the Exestuary. So at, at, at present, we, we don't have sufficient information to bring a report to this committee. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I understand the, the, the concern that this raised because obviously it is a, will have a significant impact on part of the, the area that, that um, we are looking at and our business plan refers to. Um, but it seems to me if, if there isn't a report yet um, from uh, da, 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 Natural England or the Environment Agency, sorry, apologies. Um, the Environment Agency, um, we can't discuss it, you know, if, it, if it's not there. Uh, so I suppose my question is, if we are to make the resolutions that are proposed in this agenda, does that have an impact going forward um, as and when the report... Sorry, I'm, I'm going to rewind and try, try that again. Um, <laughs> Councillor Wrigley's raised the concern about the impact of... Um, a report coming forward, an action that, that may or may not be taken. So I suppose my question is, if we go ahead, are we preventing ourselves from um, commenting on that report or amending our own business plan um, when the report is available? Does that make more sense? Sorry. <laughs> through, through the chair. So our, our role is um, to respond to the change required within our mitigation strategy um, from from the, the completion of this review from the Environment Agency. And so once that review is, is completed by the Environment Agency, we'll be able to advise on the um, amendments required to the mitigation strategy for the Dawlish Warren and excess jury. So if we, if we accept the proposals in front of us, that wouldn't stop us then commenting in future on the report when it's when it becomes available and and if necessary incorporating that into our mitigation strategy and business plan so with regards to the role of this committee we um, our role is around um, habitat mitigation our role is not um, critiquing the work of the environment agency and so we can um, review the impact that the review by the Environment Agency has upon the work of the, the committee, um, not, not the work that they're proposing to undertake. Councillor Ripley, the, the best mitigation that one can take is to avoid somebody making a mistake before they make it and to ensure that something is taken into consideration before plans are put into place and determined. My concern is that we don't passively wait for the Environment Agency to take a decision based on one part of Natural England's advice, which is about coastal erosion, compared to the other part of Natural England's advice, which is about species preservation, the other side of it. Natural England are purely looking at flood risk control and coastal erosion control in their reports they will come to a conclusion based upon that. My concern is that we have an input before they come to a final decision. They already have published reports and proposals, which is what they've been publicly showing, which is what we saw at the ex-estuary forum um, two or three months ago. So I'm surprised to hear that we don't have any uh, report from them to actually comment on. If we don't comment at an early stage, they will presume that we have no comment and our only option then is to mitigate once something has happened as opposed to say, have you thought about the birds and is it actually worthwhile thinking again because this will have significant impact on a, an internationally important site irrespective of the fact that moving it may or may not have flooding impact. Is changing the argument rather than passively waiting to respond. That's my concern. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I do get and and, um, and share the concerns that you're raising. What, what I'm trying to find a way through is is what this committee, because of its terms and ref, terms of reference, which go back to whenever they go back to, um, what, what technically we're able to do. Um, so potentially we might be looking to to put in an additional meeting 
um, you know, rather than kind of look to our normal schedule if, if and when this, this report is, is forthcoming. Um, but the other point I would make is, and I'm quite sure that, that um, you're aware of this, um, that actually going through our respective authorities to respond to this um, would also be both helpful um, and, and informative, and I'm sure that, mm. that from a team bridge point of view in particular, I know it affects all of our authorities, but, but, but you know, it is in your patch, literally, uh, and I'm quite sure you're, you're aware of it. So is, is that a potential way forward um, that um, the officers, in consultation with the chair, um, you know, and, and uh, keep, a, keep an eye on, on and when this report becomes available, as I say, that, that we might put in an emergency additional meeting, call it what you will, um, so that we can make any comments, um, as I say, but notwithstanding the fact that it may be outside our terms of reference, um, but but I would hope they would listen um, to any comment that we would, we would make. Um, if I may, I'd, I'd be very happy for that. I'd be even happier to have uh, the conversation inside Natural England so that we had one voice from Natural England where both sides of the argument were discussed. So they gave their feedback to the Environment Agency in, a, in, an, in an holistic way rather than from a single viewpoint. Yep. Uh, yeah. Sorry, just, yeah. just to say, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people from Natural England involved with this, the project at Dawlish Warren, and I'm actually probably not not directly involved with it. So in terms of answering questions, I'd need to bring in, you know, other you know specialist colleagues and senior people. So it'd be useful to know what the questions, if you've got questions from Natural England, you know, what they are beforehand to sort of contribute to the report and the discussion. So, yeah, but I'm very happy to facilitate, you know, providing the information you're looking for and, you know, ho you. hopefully justified to, yeah. Thank to you, need Ali. more information. No, no. Wearing, wearing another hat um, with <coughs> beach management plans uh, for Exmouth, well, we're, we're discussing the issue on Exmouth because it affects the beach at Exmouth. Um, we've also got um, Limston and Exton that we, uh, we have to consider with coastal protection. So I'm having to wear another hat for that and I presume Councillor Wrigley is uh, having to wear another hat with the beach management plan on uh, Dordish Warren. But the, the mitigation that we have to look at for, for this committee is a very small part of the, the big picture of what is happening on, uh, on Dordish Warren, I think. So, um, how do we proceed from this to um, to note it, and do, um, do we need to do anything more than that, Councillor Rugby? I, I'm happy to note it and to have to um, and, and simply having raised it so that uh, our officers are aware and Natural England are aware, because I think you've just demonstrated it's two different arms of Natural England. And, and the fact that, these two. well, <laughs> yeah. different tentacles of natural England um, and, and having that conversation internally, I think, is, is probably one that will be very important because, you know, in, 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 if it breaks through in the middle, Exmouth becomes a beach, not a port, and, um, and the, uh, the refuge areas become uh, the main shipping channel for uh, our boats going in and out of the X, you know, it's... it's it, it's potentially quite difficult, and it's a decision that is being driven by Natural England, because they are the ones insisting the geotube goes early. I think the clue is in natural. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, we go on to item item ten, um, Pliss Meadows update and. Naomi and I believe from um, uh, Simon Bates. Uh, through the chair, respectfully, um, Simon Bates is going to be presenting this item today. Thank you. Next slide, please, when you're ready. I'm here to move them on. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, everybody, and I'm Simon Bates, Green Infrastructure Project Manager for East Devon District Council, and it's nice to be joining the Sangs party at last. 
Uh, we've just got a few slides to update you on the uh, land that we've just acquired, just uh, west of Cranbrook, uh, which uh, working title is Cliss Meadows. Uh, we'd like to engage the public in deciding what we actually call it. So that's a working title. But as you can see from that slide, it's already rather nice. It's uh, got some great views out to Pinhoe Ridge in this slide here towards Exeter. Um, some nice marshy grasslands, some lovely trees. Uh, in the summer, lots of birdsong, warblers. Um, we've seen deer on the site. Um, and there are dormice in the hedgerows as well. So it's already a really lovely place. So Debbie, next one, please. The location of it, well, that screen's just gone black. So basically it's really well positioned. The, the land that we've acquired is, is marked out in green there. Uh, it's just off Station Road, just south of the railway line, um, just east of the little an Amazon warehouse. Um, and it will be on the doorstep of Cranbrook as Cranbrook expands into the land there marked up as Blue Haze. So it'll be right on the doorstep, ultimately. At the moment, it's about one kilometre walk from uh, Cranbrook at Young Hayes Road. Um, so, well positioned. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, some, some of the key features. So we've got some, uh, in this case, a dead tree, which is good for woodpeckers, of course. Um, and when you're on this site, you feel, you don't get the feeling that you're close to the airport or Amazon or anything like that because it's a really nicely enclosed site. So you get the feeling that you're, um, that you're wearing some green cloth uh, and um, it's quite quiet and tranquil. Um, so good, um, good assets to work from. Thanks, Debbie. Um, yeah, one of the lovely oak trees on the site. And the next one. Uh, there's a small stream, a very small stream, which originates on uh, the edge of the air airport um, in an area that's um, uh, it's urban drainage. So it's, uh, it's, it's drainage for the airport, but it's a natural vegetation type. Um, and it starts there and it, it basically goes down one side of the site, crosses over the center of the site. And this is a picture taken from that central point and then breaks out from the site along another boundary. So it's like a, a dog leg. Um, and one of the things that we'd like to do is we'd like to put a dam in at, around about this point and, and re-naturalize the stream effectively into a series of ponds and scrapes um, and create some lovely habitat. Thanks, Debbie. So the sorts of habitats we'd like to, to, to create are um, some orchard, and we'd like to do that with the public through some uh, apple tree planting. Um, extend some fen habitat, so the, the, the two girls there on the boardwalk there, the sort of uh, reed fen habitat there. And we will need to put some boardwalking in as part of the visitor infrastructure, because the site is wet in the winter. Uh, we'd like to create these scrapes and ponds and have um, a dipping platform there so that local schools can use it for nature studies. And we'd like to diversify the existing grassland um, through a sort of hay meadow regime. And we'd love to get some scything happening. Um, I understand that there's some groups in Dorset, some scything groups, um, and they're oversubscribed several times. Um, because it's a very social activity, fun, and a, a really good way to get literally very close to nature and to get to know your, your neighbour as well. So, we, so we'd like to, to harvest the hay um, uh, through some scything parties, ultimately. Thanks, Debbie. So this is the initial thoughts about the sorts of habitats that we're going to create. It's quite a complex plan, so apologies for that. But... Um, in terms of getting your bearings again, to the top 
top right hand corner is Station Road uh, and we'll create a small car park, 10 space car park just off Station Road uh, and alongside that there'll be a new cycleway connecting Cranbrook to Exeter ultimately and that's shown, hopefully you can see that yellow line outlined with black, that's the cycleway there that will pass through the site. Um, the black dotted lines are the network of paths, so there'll be a 2.5 kilometre circular trail. And then in terms of the habitats, the, the dark blue are the, the areas of ponds that we'd like to create. Um, green, dark green is woodland. The orangey colour are, are meadows. Um, and the light blue is, is floodplain grassland, basically. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there because you might have some questions. I don't know whether there was another slide, actually, Debbie. Was there another one? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So in terms of milestones, where we are. So the first thing we'd like to do is by spring next year to have full planning permission for change of use from agriculture to public open space and the construction of this small car park. Um, we've been talking to the Land Trust about the land transfer to ensure that we can manage it in perpetuity. Um, and we'd like to begin in springtime a public engagement programme, uh, in particular working with um, our artist colleagues at Thelma Holbert Gallery to try and get some uh, art installations that the local community have helped to um, design and that really speak of about the, the, the place itself and, and create a, a distinct sense of place there. Um, summer next year, we'll need to do some ecological and hydrological surveys to inform the wetland creation. And at that point, we'll also go for full planning permission for all of the in related infrastructure of paths and scrapes and things like that. Uh, we uh, hope to be able to construct those scrapes and paths in autumn next year and have the site fully open by spring 2024. That's a, a really quite challenging time frame. Um, but, um, you know, we would like to try and get people on the site as soon as possible. And I think that is the last slide. Yeah, it is. So I'm sure there's some questions. Thank you, Simon, for that. Do you, do you want to put it back to the map? Um, and have we got any questions? Location, Chair. Um, no, no, the no, no, the, 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 the that, that one there. Yeah. 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 It's nice to say that we. No, it's right next to Amazon. <laughs> yeah, good, good for your shopping, Jeff. <laughs> no, it, it is next to Amazon. And. Uh, but it's very well screened. There are some gaps in the hedgerow that we'd like to plug so that, that you know, the whole warehouse is, is not seen from the site. Thank you, Simon. So, um, uh, Councillor Rickley. Um, thank you, Chair. So, um, I'm, I must confess I'm not familiar with this one. Um, so, the point of this is essentially a countryside park for the expanded um, Cranbrook. Uh, it, yes, it's a Sangs for Cranbrook, but very specifically, it's it's related to a reserved matters application that uh, came forward for Cranbrook. I think it looks fabulous. I think uh, what's the other thing we need in there? Beavers to go in the dams and to chew the chew the trees down. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't want to over-design the wetlands because I think beavers are coming and, you know, they might be here sooner than we think, yeah. It, it, it's also uh, one of the first stepping stones for the Cliffs Valley Regional Park as well, which is a, a massive big area that we want to develop. And um, I'm really pleased that we've, we've got this off, off the ground at last. Um, and... It's so different to the other Sangs areas, uh, which is, no, uh, it's, 
No, it's, it's very flat, but th there's a lot of interest there, and I think it's going to be really beneficial for uh, uh, take, taking young children down and, and, and sort of introductory to the uh, countryside. Um, is there any other questions? I was just curious about your dipping platform. Is that for taking samples in jam jars, for jumping into and swimming? It's, uh, it's perhaps an irony, isn't it, that we, we, we do these sites for dogs to be able to have a lot of fun in and, and we can't have the same sort of fun ourselves. <laughs> but it's, it's straightforwardly for, for pond dipping. Yeah, I'm sure it is, but I'm pretty certain that there's going to be some small children who will either get pushed in or fall in. <laughs> we need your life belt. <laughs> Part of growing up and being yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, no other questions. We, we note the That's report. Right. Thank and you. thank you very much, Simon. So, we go on to um, agenda item 11 habitat mitigation team update. Thank you, Chair. Back over to you. <laughs> Um, as noted in the report, we have had some staffing changes. We welcomed Imogen to the team in August and Ben earlier this week um, after the report was written. And Caius has moved on to new opportunities in, in late October, um, but not far as he's now at um, Dornish Warren. So we've had continued fantastic work from the team, um, especially at the commencement of the wildlife refuge becoming active in September in the Exmouth area. Um, I think a highlight um, for the team has been the, the filming crew from ITV West Country joining the team in early October. And um, if you've seen, seen that, that video footage, I'm sure you'll agree they did a fantastic job on that day. Um, we also see great work from Julie, our Devon Loves Dog um, coordinator, running waggy walks in a variety of locations, which is welcomed by Natural England, as well as a steady increase in membership numbers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Naomi, for that. Have we got any questions? Um, I'd like to thank the, I'd like to thank the team because it is extremely useful to get these updates and to understand what they're doing and what it actually means on the ground. So I know it's probably a, a, a pain for them to do, but I find it extremely valuable and it gives us a much better idea of what's going on. So I'd like to thank them for putting this through, and it sounds like it's been a, a, a good a good session. So thank thank you. Councillor Yeah, thank you. Yeah, again, it is useful to know. And um, even if team members are, are kind of arriving and, and then moving on before we've even got a chance to meet them. But I think that, that's great. And it actually speaks to um, the, the work that's being done and the opportunities we're, we're giving people, particularly if they're, um, you know, the, the early parts of, of their careers. And again, if they're moving um, to uh, a, a related post um, still within one of the three authorities, I think that that's that's great. But um, yeah, yeah, and I think the um, the devil of dogs things is just it's just been remarkable. I think when we first started talking about it, um, I don't think I ever imagined that it, it would be you know quite as big and and, and active and and successful uh, as it has been. Uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for the report. Um, and um, that brings our meeting to a close, and I would like to thank everyone uh, attending today. So thank you. Thank you so much.